We were in negotiations. We're investing in real estate. They're winning, they're making money. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to the Real Estate Educators Podcast, where we provide the education you can build on. I am your host, Kevin Amalsh. I am having so much fun with this podcast because we get to help real estate investors and real estate educators. So if you're an investor, you're a realtor, you're an attorney, you're someone who wants to educate and help real estate investors, this is the podcast for you. If you haven't yet, please help us build the podcast so we could help more people just like you. We could do that by giving us a quick five-star review and maybe sharing it with your, your friends, your family, someone. So help us out if you can. I am super excited about today's episode because Jonathan has more experience than anybody we've had on the podcast. So I'm going to dig in here. I want to learn as much as I possibly can. One of the most fun things about hosting a podcast is what you get to learn from some of the other guests and experts. So super excited, 45 years of experience. So he says something somewhere around five years old, he started uh, being mentored by his father and then 30 years on his own. So he's a, he's got a real estate company. So a lot of on market stuff. He does a lot of off market investing. He's a coach, a life coach, real estate coach, and he has one of the fastest growing podcasts in the world. Cool, man. Jonathan, I'm so excited to have you. Welcome to the show. Yeah, Kevin, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here too. talk to your audience and then have you on my podcast soon as well, because we're scheduled for that. Yeah, I'm excited to be on yours as well. One of the fastest growing. I'm excited. Thank you for inviting me on. Yeah, so let's go it. way back. I want to hear your story. So I don't know how to do that, man, without going all the way back. So you said <laughs> early, early on, you were being mentored by your dad. He was a he was a attorney, but he made yep. his money in real estate. So take me back. What's it like to live under the roof with a real estate, a successful real estate investor? Yeah. So I mean, part of that comes from my parents. My so my parents got divorced when I was like two. So I lived with my mom in Brooklyn on the weekdays, and then I would go to my dad's every weekend. So my dad would be waiting for me outside school every Friday, bring me back every Sunday. But we spent literally the entire weekend together, and he was always doing these things like going to yard sales, looking at properties, and we wanted I won't want it to be with them. You know, I only saw him on the weekends. So I pretty much went along the way. And I was telling you before, I probably had been in like a minimum of at least 100 homes before I was even 10, just looking around. Obviously, I didn't know what I was doing. But at the time, you know, there was no internet. So we would get the foreclosure list from the courthouse. He knew the clerks, and then we would run through the list. But old way of foreclosures for people who are listening who obviously weren't, you know, uh, not as old as I am. <laughs> uh, but like, you just got the list, there was no internet. And like, you would go to the house, and then you look in and if it's vacant, uh, you would try to go in, but it, the doors were usually locked. So he would open a window and I would go through the small cracks and go around, open the door, get us in. And that's just how old school foreclosures were. Uh, we did have plenty that were occupied, but you know, I learned along the way because he was buying and putting stuff in my name at a young age. So I was I owned a lot of properties before I was 18 and trust for myself and my sister. And he was very smart about just teaching me whether I was listening or not. You know, I would go pick up rents with him, look at rehabs, you know, talk to the tenants. Uh, and that eventually turned into me starting to collect the rents for him when I was come home from college every summer. Oh, that's amazing. So you... He was literally teaching you how to break and enter <laughs> before yep, you yep, were... <laughs> Yeah, did a lot of burglaries as a child. A little so technically at the, the time, yeah, technically <laughs> at the time they really weren't because they were in the foreclosure process and vacant and there was no, like even code boxes existed, but nobody used them back then. So like when you, you kind of knew the rhythm, but you, and we door knocked a lot of foreclosures too and got yelled at, but I, I don't know, he would just get me ice cream afterwards. So I didn't care. <laughs> oh, that's great. And then you would just run around and, and let, let him in the front door. Yeah. 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 Met several times to my, I have a very good memory and I can kind of see the things that, that I used to do with him. And a lot of almost everything was really real estate related or money related in some way. Cause he was just kind of always teaching me um, about everything along the way. Yeah, that's huge, man. And I'm trying to do that with my kids. And I know you talked about that with your years are a little bit older in college. Yeah. Um, but we're teaching like we're playing rich dad, poor dad with them and trying to yeah. teach them. And man, they just don't have the interest yet. And you you gave me some hope. You said maybe maybe they'll snap out of it. Yeah, because if I look at my journey, like in high school, I, I did I was still doing all this stuff. You know, I was learning about stocks. I was looking at, at houses, you know, looking at flips. Uh, 
but it didn't really click into like 1820s. And even from for my son, we've played cash flow before. Um, and now he's interested. He's interested in the investing side. He's interested in, you know, getting his license because I have an on-market team. So I think it's just a matter of like deciding, at least for me, not putting pressure on like, hey, this doesn't have to be your job, but like this is going to be something that you can do on the side or you could do as a full-time job. And I think that's, I was kind of steadily investing. And I know from talking to so many investors, like a lot of people don't consider themselves investors. They're like, oh, well, I have a personal home and then I have this two family. And I'm like, wait, you're an investor. When you buy yeah, yeah. when you buy your first home, if it's a condo or anything, like you're an investor and that's how I treat on-market real estate, which is why I look at it differently. Everything's an investment to me, which leads to less emotional attachment and more like, hey, are we making a good purchase on this? Is this a good asset? And that's helped me dramatically as an investor, whereas your your newfangled investors are more like in the spreadsheets and looking out of state, but they don't have a lot of experience looking at homes. And I, I use my experience as a way to educate them and tell them like, listen, no matter what you want to buy, if you want to buy 2000 miles away, look at as many homes in your area as you can. You know, if you don't have an agent that wants to take you out because you're not going to buy in the area, just go to open houses. You need to look at houses and, and look at basements and understand, you know, what uh, mold smells like and what feels weird and then take pictures and ask questions. It's the only way you're really going to understand what you're investing in and houses are likely to appreciate. But if you make bad purchases because you're not paying attention to the right things, you could put yourself in a tough spot. Yeah, no, that's huge. There's so many areas or so many directions we can go with what you just said. And we'll come back to that. But I, I want to dig into to your story a little bit more after. So so you, you've been investing in yourself 30 years. So how does how do you get started? You're young, you still look super young, man. So Thanks. you must have been really young when you when you got started. Yeah, I mean, and I again I uh, before 18, I owned a, a lot of properties, some that I actually still own uh because my dad was smart. He he worked for the IRS before and he was a he was a wills and estates attorney. So he placed things in us. So I was I was still working real estate before, but I started investing on my own at about uh 20. I was working, I had investment properties from 18 to 22, but I bought my first pri primary residence um right when I was in law school. Uh, so around 22, uh, 22, 23. Uh, and that's when I started kind of embarking on my own personal journey and realized like, wait a minute, I'm just doing what my dad did. I'm like actively trying not to, you know, be like, oh, I'm just doing what you did. And then I realized I was doing it because um, my first I bought a townhouse in Plantation, Florida as my first like primary residence on my own. And I, at the time, again, there's no internet. So there was about seven available in a development, typical Florida development. Um, and I just bought the one that looked worse, the worst. And all I did was paint it, recarpet it, you know, add and like really didn't upgrade that much. And when I left about 18 months later, I made 25,000. You know, this is a long time ago. This is 30 years ago. So I was like, this is, this is amazing. Is this what my dad was talking about? He was still alive at the time. So I was like, I'm doing it right. And he's like, yeah, you're doing it. And that really set off the bug for like then me focusing on more of the of the properties that I owned either together with him or with my sister uh, and figure it out. And I think, you know, like you were saying before, like from a parenting perspective, I've learned a lot about just being open about money and allowing my kids to interact with it and, you know, try to invest on their own at young ages. And, you know, if they lose the money, they lose the money. It has to be an amount that you can teach from. Yeah. Okay. Good. So there are, and they're not investing now. Or your son is getting his. You said we're before I hit record. Your yeah. son's working on his license. Your daughter is yeah. not interested at all. So, does he have an interest in the investing side also, or yeah. is it just like the transaction? No, no, much more in the investing side. He he lives okay. in a in a four family that somebody I know owns. Like I rent the place for him. He lives there. So he's he's living in a multifamily. So we talk about multifamilies a lot, and then we go look at condos. You know that I could buy for him. Um, but yeah, I think he's steadily getting into it. And I think my daughter will too, you know, as I think as uh, if I look back on mine, I started to see the scale because I would come home in the summers and then my dad would tell me to get the rents from all these people who are like six months behind. And that kind of, I started to understand landlording differently. And there's a ton of new investors now who don't understand how difficult landlording is. 
Like, and I never, I'm not, I'm never going to pay for property management. Like the only time I've ever had a property manager is when we had so many properties in one area, we just hired a full-time property manager of our own. But like, if you're just a one-off investor, you shouldn't be paying 15% for property management when you can just go collect the rent online and fix things. So I, I, you know, he, I would come home and he would teach me about trying to get the rent. And in the beginning I was like, well, this is dumb. I don't really want to do this, but I like to learn stuff. And then he said, listen, if you get the rent collected, I'll give you, I think at the time it was like, you'll, I'll give you 10% straight out. You can just take it and go buy video games. And I'm like, huh, okay, this sounds good. I'm incentivized. And then I started to learn and, and learn about working with people, which is what real estate's all about. So you were the muscle. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I was uh, scared out of my mind, didn't know how to communicate. And I was just trying to figure it out. Uh, but I realized, you know, we did have a decent amount of rental properties. I, I just realized that it's more about listening and trying to figure out what the problem was, you know, from a financial perspective at that age. And even sometimes I think people now at whatever age, they think like, oh, well, they're not paying. They're just deadbeats. And then you go talk to them and it's like, oh, they lost a job. You know, right. they're not trying to screw me over. They really want to pay. So that's why, like, my dad would allow them to get behind. And, and honestly, they all ended up paying. It was just a little bit slower. And it was me who kind of came up with this partial payment idea at the time, which is like, well, why don't we start paying by the week? You just give us whatever you can for the week. So because if you wait till the end of the month, you're going to spend it. So let's get some in the coffer each week. And I was there for the summer. So I would just go, you know, pick it up. Uh, on the week and that that started to work out and then they felt better because they weren't you know they wouldn't uh, something wouldn't come up you know they just figure it out so jonathan you and i agree on the property management piece <clears throat> for the most part i get pushback on that one a lot a lot of people think that if they hire a property manager they might uh have better success with keeping rents where they're supposed to be and ah. and the collection side of things which we're, we're talking about here uh, so i agree with you and especially at the beginning you should manage your own properties I chose to, to hire a property management company for condos. So I have a, I have a yeah. portfolio of condos. I have a portfolio of single family. The condos, I got to tell you, man, were driving me crazy because now I have neighbors complaining. I got my yeah. kids complaining about neighbors. I have no control over that. And I've got HOAs in and out of my business, not helping, not supporting, not following the bylaws, all of these problems. And it was like, I could pay 10, 8, 10%. And all of this goes away. So I chose to do it with the condos. Uh, yeah. Outside of that, though, I totally agree with you. Yeah, but no, I actually agree with that, too, because me personally, I need a buffer between me and tenants. I'd, I'm not, I'm terrible with actually I was at the time I learned. And then what I learned is like, that's not for me. Like I need somebody else. I like to manage the manager. Um, so, you know, that was when my sister and I, we owned a lot of properties together. She would deal with the tenants. I would deal with evictions and deal with anything legal because I was a lawyer. Um, and I, I do think that who not how principle smart. And obviously, the more units you have, the more opportunity you have to make property management worth it. You know, it's that volume, like one off property management is not a great spend for me. If you have three or four units in the same area, which is something I like to call clustering, uh, then it's a great idea. Because you can get it for less. If they're going to get five, then maybe you're down at seven percent instead of you know eight or nine percent, and then it's a better hedge on your bet. Um, but there are issues with property management. You're still managing the manager, and if you don't do that, you're going to lose out a ton on repairs. Is where you lose the most money. And then look, uh, there are great property management uh, companies out there, but a lot of them are just going to put in the first renter, say it's good. And I'm someone who's like, no, I want to see the NTN, you know, I want to see the reports, I want to know about criminal history, I want to know everything that is available to me, so I can make the best decisions, because so, I don't want to have a problem with the tenant, I want to have a great tenant. Um, and and what I've learned over the years is sometimes there is a story, uh, if, if you're not falling for a story, sometimes there's a good story as to why, like, it's not a perfect application, but they do turn out to be a great tenant. So I like to review all that stuff myself, which is what I also enjoy. Yeah, that's interesting. When uh, when I, I went through 2008, and I, I definitely want to get to that because not many of us, there's not many of us. Yeah, left, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, w I went through that. And when I was going, when I was trying to attract tenants, um, I would really focus on the the bankruptcies because yeah. those, I mean, we, we were all going through a hard time and, and they would not qualify for a lot of apartments and that kind of thing, but they were right. great people and great tenants. And so I had a lot of success with that. Um, yeah. And they had no debt, right? So 
Yeah, I mean, uh, that's one of the great things about being a landlord. You know, people look at landlords and think overall, like, oh, everybody's just a slumlord. There's a lot of opportunity that you can provide a lot of affordable housing, depending on what type of properties you're buying. Yeah. Um, and it's what I always say is that it's silly to not take care of the tenants because the tenants are caretaking the biggest investment that you have. So why wouldn't you take care of them? And that's why I try to give, you know, my multifamily uh, clients who are either house hacking or buying, investing in multifamilies, I give them, you know, some quick tips that might help them be better landlords and give better amenities to the tenants. So they treat it like a home and not a rental. Then you're going to have less wear and tear, less calls, less problems. And then it's it's smoother. It's still not it's not passive. You know, landlording is not passive, no matter right, what anybody yeah. says. And, <laughs> and uh, having a property manager doesn't necessarily make it passive. It just makes it easier. Yeah, totally agree. And um, I love how you're saying this. Like, so if you think about tenants, that's your, that's your customer. So yeah. why wouldn't you take care of them, right? You take care of your yeah. customer. But also, so, I mean, like your customer can ruin your investment. If they oh, want to put sure. rocks down the toilet, they can. If they want to like let the flames go too much in the kitchen or not tell you about the mold, they can. So it like, I, I, Real estate is all relationships, whether it's tenancy, syndications, anything that you're doing in real estate, you're going to do better if you're good at building relationships. And the tenant to landlord relationship is so important. That's why it's always like funny to me when someone's like, well, I don't want them to know I'm the landlord. I'm like, why? <laughs> you are the landlord. Like you want to have a good relationship with the tenants. You don't want to hide from them. Yeah. And a lot of times they'll move and they'll love you and they'll ask if you have anything else available. I, yeah, I or that they'll help you. They'll bring in their friend. As, I oh, mean, yeah, college exactly. rentals is a no brainer. College rentals, for anybody who doesn't know, the scale of doing it the right way is, you know, you try to get people as the sophomores and then they go sophomore, junior, senior. And then at senior year, they just bring in the, the exact replica of them who are sophomores, either, you know, in their major, in their fraternity, sorority. You can just keep going without ever putting them on the market if you're smart with who you're renting to and how you take care of them. Because college rentals, you kind of need to like half parent them. They don't even know how to turn on the air conditioning. They're like, what's, how does this work? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, I don't have any college rentals. I never have. So I would never have thought of that. But that's that's actually really smart. Um, all right. So I, I got to hear more about this story like because you've had so much success. So I want to like learn from you. Sure. Your first one you bought, you lived in it. You kind of did a little carpet, paint carpet rehab. You made 25 grand. Yeah. What, what, you're obviously a, a long-term investor. You You're looking at for long-term growth it sounds like you're not a big fix and flipper necessarily it doesn't sound like but correct me if i'm wrong tell me about your about your next deal and and then let's go into your portfolio yeah so i mean generally over the years we held uh single family properties as rentals and we were doing short-term rentals like more than 20 years ago like when verbo oh, just wow. started before airbnb um because we had properties in areas that were extremely short-term rental friendly in the Hamptons and Florida, California, where these options were like really good for us. So I think my dad was way ahead of my time. And I think my sister and I were like ahead of our time, you know, before I found sites like bigger pockets, like we were just kind of like hammering it out. But I think the thing that I've always been best at and probably my best investments have all been my personal residences. Uh, always. I, I know how to buy uh, I know how to fix up and I know how to pick a neighborhood that's going to appreciate. So in Florida, multiple times, I doubled my money by just buying in the right neighborhood. And after I left that first deal, uh, I bought a, a house in downtown Fort Lauderdale in an area called Rio Vista, which was extremely like quirky and cool, but still like not perfect. There was a bunch of like, you know, houses because some falling down. But like that, I probably doubled my money in just like, you know, th three years or something um, just because I knew how to buy. And I still do that now. And I I did. I, I have flipped a lot in my life because uh, it's uh, I just like it, but never high volume. You know, if I'm doing it as a straight investment, I'll flip maybe one or two at a time at the max. And then I often do what I call back flipping, which is I buy a house that I really like. I live in it, enjoy it. And then. I go buy another house and I still don't sell my house. And then I do a full flip to upgrade it to whatever people are looking for now. Cause a lot of times I don't have enough time in the beginning, like at my house now, I, I didn't have time to do the floors. So whenever I leave, I buy a house first uh, and then I'm going to flip the house. Well, that's why I call it backflip because it's at the end. And I did that on one in Montclair, I did great. 
Um, so that's another strategy that I think you can use because you built up the equity. So even if you don't have extra cash laying around, you could just take a HELOC and do the renovation. So it's pretty, it's pretty simple to do. And then you, you're hitting the market at the right time. Okay. That's it. I've never heard of that strategy or that term, but I do like the idea of moving and selling and moving and selling. Yeah. Um, I was doing that for a while too. So big tax benefits there, right? You don't have to pay the, the gains. Are you, you're still doing that now? Uh, I mean, I'm pretty stable where I am now. I really like where I live now. I have a, an, an accessory dwelling unit in the back over in my garage that my daughter lives in. So that's kind of like, can't really be any better. Um, and that's uh, kind of doing it this way is really adjusted me to ADUs in general. Uh, I think like I'll always be looking for properties where I can have, you know, apartments over the garage. So even as my kids get older, you know, and they're off on their own, you know, when they come back, they have a place to stay and then you can always, you know, short term rental those as well. Um, and it's just very popular and underknown. But my uh, growing up, I always lived in an accessory dwelling unit at my dad's because we were loud. I had two stepbrothers and and uh, we had a, a ADUs at every single house because we were too loud and my stepmom was always yelling at us. So he's like, I just build a house, you know, back there. So we always lived in these like rando houses on the property that we could do whatever we want from like the young, like 14, 15. We're like, you know, I don't know, 200 feet across the driveway, but we're not going to keep them up all night. Uh, easy. It makes it a lot easier to sneak out. Huh? No, they didn't care. I had no rules growing up. <laughs> my dad was like, uh, you know, my mom was a hippie and my dad was like, a, just like not a disciplinarian. So, uh, and I never really did anything bad, but that, that's part of what I've, you know, in investing, I think you have to take educated risk. And he taught me that it was very okay to take educated risk, you know, starting in stocks and then going in real estate, as long as you're doing your research, you know, and it's based on something and then to trust your gut, like your gut is a good thing, but you have to see a lot of houses, like I said before, to know that your gut's making sense and it's not emotional. It's like, okay, money versus uh, what my knowledge is in education. Like it does make sense. Are you still doing the short-term rental stuff? No, I, we, we, I think the last one we got rid of was a few years ago. I, I'm, I'm interested in getting back into short-term rental. Um, but again, I, again, that's a buffer business for me too. Like I'd have to have a manager, um, you know, and we have some pretty good tips for short-term rentals uh, that I learned over the years. Uh, I like it. I don't think that it's oversaturated. I just think a lot of people who shouldn't have been buying short-term rentals were buying them and they didn't really want to manage them. And to me, short-term rentals is is uh, more hospitality business than a real estate investment. And if you come from hospitality, you'll be amazing at short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. Like now the best Agreed. money in them is you can still do them in any market. You just have to spend a decent amount of money on making it an experience and not just a tiny, like just a regular getaway. Yeah. And with the, I mean, the, the supply has increased significantly since you started doing it. So that is yeah, for sure values way. I mean- yeah. nightly rental values way down. So it, it, what I'm, what I'm seeing, and I, I don't know that much about it, but I, what I'm seeing is it's a tough business right now. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, you have to spend a lot of money to make the property attractive. And I think you can do that in any market and you'll beat all the other properties. You have to be really good using sites like air DNA to just look at what the, the data is in the area and I actually just go on Airbnb when I'm interested in an area and I just see how many active, you know, rentals there are, I like to look myself, I look through and I'm like, okay, because there's a lot of areas where you just have a bunch of like, what used to be the the old school short term rental, which is just like, it doesn't look good, but it's like in a really nice spot. So you get your monthly. But now like a lot of my friends are just going like real experience. But like, if you look at somebody like Rob built, like he just put in two pickleball courts at one, you know, and he did a, a miniature golf course at another, like this is next level stuff. But that's yeah, exactly geez. what we learned in the pandemic is that, look, if people want to go away, they don't necessarily want to be out all day. They just might want to be at another location that's not their house and ha and like not have to leave. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't think about any of that. We have we do have a short term, one short term rental, but we use it more than we even rent yeah, it because yeah. we it's a vacation home for us. But, uh, but I, that, yeah, I just don't know much a, about it. But that's a great point, though. All of our short term rentals were houses that we used. And then we were like, well, we're not there all the time. So let's make money. And Verbo exactly. had just come out. So we were doing on Verbo and HomeAway. And we were like, the whole point to getting short term rentals back then 
was we would buy them in areas where my sister's best friends lived because they were all young moms and, you know, they'd either be home with the kids and they could manage the property, you know, and they were great at it because they knew like we're obsessive and they would be there for anything that we need. And then we didn't need to like overpay for property management. They were already your friends. They got paid, but like it was, we could trust them right away. Yeah. And they enjoy it because it's designing it and making sure. Exactly. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, okay, so let's go back to 2008 I, because I don't, I don't get to ask many <laughs> guests this. Yeah, so yeah. Tell me, what did it look like entering that? So I remember 2007 when rates were going up. We all had adjustable rates then. Rents were coming down. You started to feel that squeeze. And then, you know, the banks start collapsing, obviously, in eight. So what what was that like for you? Um, so uh, fortunate in some ways, unfortunate in others, but not worse than what happened to other people. The fortunate portion was I had a, I was basically a cash investor up until the time I got divorced in my low thirties. So I had access to a lot of capital based on what I did in my investments. So that, that made it like better for me. I, on the properties that we held, we were very easy for us to ride out 2008. Our, our tenancy pay rate was probably like 90 to 95%, even the ones that that 5%, like they eventually paid. Um, and you know, it it does make it a little difficult. However, um, I made some interesting decisions and I didn't know that 2008 was coming. And in late 2007, um, my ex-wife and I both agreed to move from Florida back to Brooklyn separately. We were going to move, kids were going to move. We're all going to like be in the same area. And, And, and so I, I was in the art world at the time and I was renovating a gallery on the Lower East Side and then the bottom dropped. And I had two houses in Florida that I I was about to put up for sale. So I put them both up for sale, mine and and where my ex was, uh, and both like did not sell. And I made a classic decision. uh, Like when I, uh, this is, everybody likes this story because it's, no one wants to tell their worst decision, but this is my worst decision. And it happened because of 2008. So I put my house in Florida as the best house that we've ever had. We did, we we built a three-car garage with an ADU, uh, like a lagoon pool. So uh, I hired a realtor who I was friends with. I wasn't licensed at the time, but I thought I was smarter. So she said, no, I think you're like 1.5 range. And I'm like, no, it's 2.3. Like, that's what I want. That's what we're getting. So we listed for 2.3 first week, right before the bottom dropped out. Like it was just kind of starting, but it was still like, okay. Someone comes in, offers 1.4. I'm at 2.3. I'm horrendously offended you know, like go tell them, tell them to screw themselves. Like I'm not taking the, you know, 1.4. Uh, so, well, you know, of course I don't take it like an idiot because I was my worst client at the time, uh, end up, you know, switching, switching agents, switching, switching agencies. And then the bottom drops out. I probably sold it like in the high eights. So I bit all oh. that money, uh, because of my ego and it was a really nice house. And I really think it was worth a lot. It just wasn't worth, what I thought. But the best story about a loss is I had prepped my whole life to be okay, that if these things go wrong, so I lost money on the between the 1.4 and the high eights. Uh, and I did lose money on the house because we bought it for well, maybe high sixes, and then we put in about 500. So I did I did lose money. But uh, on my other house that I had sold, I didn't I didn't lose money. I, I, you know, I did, I did. Okay. Actually, I think I did lose a little bit of money, but you know, it, it wasn't like a, a, you know, people who invested in like, you know, hundred units in Texas that time. And then just it completely went bankrupt. So uh, again, that's another part where my dad saved me. I was capitalized the right way. Uh, a lot of properties I had uh, fortunately owned in cash. So I kind of rode 2008, but the, the secondary decision was I got really freaked out in 2008 about that. And I took all my money and I just put it in the bank. I took it out of stocks and I just put it in the bank because the stocks were tanking. Uh, and I left it there for years and didn't, I wasn't like investing. Like my sister and I just kind of like both got scared. Like what's happening with the world? Cause we hadn't at, at a, at a, at a correct age been through something like that. Um, and then I eventually wisened up and put some stuff back in index funds and started investing, um, again. <laughs> when did you get back into real estate then? I was always in because we had a lot of properties, but really like during the pandemic, we sold most of our oldest properties. So well, back like, in 2008, like after the crash, when did you start buying again? Oh, uh, pretty quickly. Down? Yeah. I mean, I, I was just, I wasn't investing in stocks. That's what I was scared of. Oh, um, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
but I was still doing like a, a flip here and there. But as I moved back, I, when I did eventually one year later move from Florida to Brooklyn, I wasn't really investing at the time. I was more like I was back in the, literally living on the block that I grew up on. So I was just like enjoying having my kids back in Brooklyn. Uh, and then steadily, once I got my real estate license uh, about 10 years ago, then I was like, okay, wait, I know a lot. So then I started combining the the on market business with, you know, investors. So I obviously work with a ton of investors, have a big investor platform. And that's what ended up with the podcast as well. Cool. And I want to get into all of that for sure. But I'm yeah. going to go back into this 2008, try to see if I can extract a lesson here. Mm -hmm. So you were pretty hard on yourself, Jonathan, for not taking the one for and I'm thinking, how in the hell is he supposed to know that it's going to drop like that? So, but you're being hard on yourself. So, what would you say you learned from that experience? Um, I, I look, I picked a real estate agent because she was good and she was a good agent, and I didn't listen to her. So now, as an agent, clients who don't listen to me, I fire them right away. Um, so my biggest mistake was thinking I was smarter than someone who was an expert in the business. You know, just because I wanted more. And now I've learned that from sellers, you know, we've had sellers have had a great ride during the pandemic, but let's come into a halt like right now. So we're recording on November 15th, but it's not the same for sellers. So sellers are going to get a rude awakening soon with buyers not playing all their games. And, and I think that's the lesson. It's like, listen, if you want to sell, you don't have to list low, but you have to list appropriate and you have to, you know, also know what's wrong with your property. You know, I, ours was, there was nothing wrong with it. It was like perfect. But, you know, if you're, if you're looking at sellers now, like I would be doing inspections myself as a seller before I put something on the market. And that's a big lesson because what happens when something goes wrong, a lot of sellers say, well, I don't want to know Then I have to disclose it. I said, well, they're going to do an inspection and then they're going to find out Then your transaction is going to take way longer. Then you're going to go back on market and people are going to think something's wrong with it because something is wrong with it. And if you just did a pre-inspection, you could have either fixed it or disclosed it and said like, hey, we're not going to fix this, but this is available. Then people have a trust concept on your property and it's not, you know, it doesn't turn into something like a yeah, problem right. later. And when they when they come back with their objection, they're going to tell you what's wrong, and then you got to disclose it anyway. Right, exactly. They, it, it, you know, real estate is. It, it, there's so much going on in the like on market real estate world right now, but it's like built on this like old school philosophy where people are just like, oh no, well this is the way you know this is the way my parents did it. It's like when you're showing like millennial clients who are actually great, much to what people say, they're they're great clients. They understand the data. And then their parents show up and their parents are like, well, I've never bid over asking. And you're like, things sell for 200 to 500,000 over asking in my market. Like this isn't an option for you to say. And then they show up at inspection and ruin everything. So there is an adjustment to be made. <laughs> So when your generation gets involved, that's when the deal gets screwed up. <laughs> yeah, I like to think I'm ahead of that, but I can see myself going to one of my kids when they buy their first houses. I will definitely be there, but I, I think I'll be able yeah. to be okay. Yeah, you understand it. So I, I, would agree. Yeah. I would agree with you. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about what you're doing right now. So you have the podcast. You're having a lot of success with that. You're doing an on-market, you have an on-market platform through EXP, I think. And then you have, yep. you're doing your offline stuff and your coaching. So gosh, how do you have time for all of this? But I don't know where you want to start, but I'm I'm dying to, I'm dying to get into the coaching for sure. But you want to talk yeah. about the real estate side and then we can talk more about yeah. what you're doing on the coaching side. Yeah. I mean, look, really, it's all tied together. Like I said, when I, when I got my real estate license, my sister was like, why didn't you do this before? We could have saved so much money. I'm like, <laughs> oh, you're right. Because what, what people yeah. look at real estate agents, they don't think it's a real job. They just think like, it's just like a side hustle. And when I got into real estate, I was like, no, like I'm all in and I, and I, I know things. And so I was, I did pretty well as just like a random solo agent right away. And that started to just kind of click everything about real estate. Like, wait, I know more than almost all real estate agents. And I certainly know more about investing. So only 1% of agents, if even that, know anything about investing. You know, they're focused on a transaction and a commission, but I'm trying to train my agents and even people who are looking for agents to look for people who understand investing. And that's why I say to even your regular first-time homebuyers, look, this is the biggest investment you're ever going to make. We need to look at this with an investment lens, like where have prices been, where are they going to go, you know, what type of repairs do you have to do? And being in so many houses up until that point in my life, that's where it's a huge thing. I know what everything costs to repair, 
And I'm constantly updating that in my head. And that's where a lot of people are, are, are not getting the right advice right now with, you know, an agent telling them, oh, that's like, you know, you know, it's cost you seven grand to do the kitchen. And then they don't realize what taste they have. And it costs 60 grand, you know, and then the, the client can't do the kitchen. So um, I think steadily, I just started working with more investors because that was what I liked. And then that slowly kind of morphed into this. I, I originally started like this investor services kind of like consultation business, like seven or eight years ago. And that was just talking to investors. And then when the pandemic happened and none of us could get out, we started these Zoom meetups, which eventually is what turned into the podcast. And the meetups started to go crazy. We'd have uh, about like 20 to 40 people on each Zoom. But during the pandemic, inside the group of just those investors, we did one for New Jersey, one for Philadelphia, one for uh, West Coast of Florida, one for Boston. Uh, and we ended up doing almost 100 deals like that were a lot were out on referrals or they were just doing deals, but they were just getting advice. And what I found then was like, it's really the camaraderie of investors that helps people get off the bench and into the game. Uh, like until you see somebody who's just like you, and then you find out like that guy has like 37 units and they're just like hanging out. Like, yeah, because it doesn't, it's not what it looks like on social media, you know, just read the millionaire next door. Like the people that have the most real estate, you don't know anything about them. They're not on Instagram. They're just getting units. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> the pandemic is really what took off the zoom. And is that where the coaching, the coaching was born out of that? Yeah. Or how, I, well, how I was the coaching play in here. Um, I got really proficient as a real estate agent. So I started doing on market coaching for a company at the time called club wealth. Uh, and then I was coached uh, by the Tom Ferry organization and my coach, Mike Shum. And then I started to realize like I can coach investors. I still actually don't really do a uh, coach for pay right now. It's more through the Zooms, but okay. we're about to launch our first set of like masterminds and things. But I wanted to know that, you know, for three to five years that I'm just give everything that I know away for free. So that eventually when I create a mastermind or like getaway groups or weekend groups or any type of program, no one's going to blink at what it costs because I've been giving everything away. And the truth is, I'm very comfortable knowing what my worth is. And I like to give stuff away for free. So I'm never going to stop giving away stuff for free. But we are working on building smaller masterminds because they've helped me a tremendous amount. Same as like the Zooms help for people. Look, then no one has to pay to be at, at the Zooms or at my in-person meetups now. And that's a great way to just build the camaraderie and and start to just kind of be, you know, get into the game without feeling like, you know, you have to be somebody or look some way or feel some way or have some educational background, you know, to get into it. Well, then you're building trust, right? So if you, I assume, and you're building credibility, and when you have trust and credibility, I mean, people want to do business with you, right? So are you starting to get some business out of it, some transactions, some leads, oh, some deal flow? What? Yeah, I mean, hundreds a year. I mean, you know, I get I get plenty of activity just through Instagram because I'm not, I, I'm a terrible salesperson. I'm very good. I'm a great real estate agent because I'm not trying to sell. I'm trying to be a real estate advisor. I'm not a salesperson, even though they make us call ourselves that. I'm just an advisor. I always kill deals for my clients, you know, and that's, and they always say like, wow, no, no real estate agent or like, you know, when I'm doing advising on investment, like no one ever tells us it's a bad deal. I'm like, yeah, don't you think that's a problem? Like most deals aren't, they're not right. Cause you don't know anything. So I think like you're saying, like trust is the most important thing. That's why I turn my hub site and all my my socials are trust green. And everybody knows that's me. I'm honest to a fault. I will tell people it's a terrible deal. I'll walk away from deals, which I think is your biggest power in real estate investing is your ability to walk away, not how much money you have. And and getting that is just starting to figure out what, what the journey is going to be like. Um, and you can't do it without trust. And so that's how, sure, I, I get a lot of like, you know, everybody gets spammed in the industry. Like we all get spammy content, but I've had tons of uh, leads just from, you know, either my YouTube channel or from Instagram that have turned into clients, great friends. And for me, the best thing about working with investors as an agent is that they're repeat customers. You know, you do a great job. They trust you. Not only do they want to do more transactions with you, they're going to bring their friends. And they don't, they, they listen to what you say, you know, my investors listen to me and I listen to them. And that's the type of relationship that you want. If you're an investor looking for an agent, there's just not a lot of 
investor friendly, really investor friendly agents. But if you dig, you'll find them in any market. And if you don't know them, I'll, I, I know them. So I can refer them anywhere because they really understand what they're doing. They understand the data. You can't buy an eight unit apartment building with like your cousin, Freddie. Like that's just not a good idea. <laughs> The Real Estate Educators Podcast is brought to you by Pine Financial Group. Pine Financial Group is a private lender specializing in value add bridge lending for real estate investors. This is accomplished by raising private money from individual investors and lending that money out in short term real estate loans. Pine operates one of the coolest public mortgage funds on the market because it brings consistency and security to your investment portfolio without giving up on returns. The fund pays its investors a flat 8% return with monthly distributions. There is a low minimum investment and no lockup period. That's right. You can request all of your money back at any time without any fees. Diversify your portfolio out of Wall Street and into Main Street with the Pine Financial Group Public Fund PFG Fund 5. Find out more at pinefinancialgroup.com. That's pinefinancialgroup.com. If I'm an agent and I want to target investors for the exact reason you're just saying, it's more yeah. residual, there's more repeat. And let's face it, first time home buyers, that there's a ton of emotion in those transactions. I'm not an yeah. agent, so I'm just speculating yeah. here, but yeah. That feels like a lot of work and a lot of emotion. And real estate investors are more, hey, this is a commodity. I'm trading on the numbers. Yeah. So if I want those types of clients and I wanted to attract it through content and maybe it's a Zoom because it sounds like you've had a ton of success with yeah. Zoom meetings. Like what kind of, how do I get started doing a Zoom meeting for investors where I could, where I could provide value? Yeah. I think this is a great avenue to go down for, for especially for your audience. I mean, uh, one, it's how much value can you add? Like you said, you have to prove your value to investors. Um, like you're you're not just going to be able to like put them on an auto email. I can't tell you how many investors are on auto emails from all the agents. And and don't for one second think you're going to meet an investor and they don't know 10 agents. They know 10 agents. Oh yeah. So do you want to be like the 10 agents or do you want to be that much better than the 10 agents? You know, and if you don't know, obviously I I un, you know, fortunately had a lot of information so I I could really give them good feedback cuz I was an investor. And investors definitely want to work with agents who have invested. They will work with ones who haven't, but you really have to understand the game and you have to understand what their, you know, what their goals are. Not everybody is trying to make the same goals. You have cash flow investors, appreciation investors, you know, house hackers, people who want commercial, they want mixed use because they can use it for something else. And you have to dig in deep on those conversations. But look, investors are also not necessarily loyal in general. You know, if some other agent brings them a deal, they're going to take it. And it's up to you whether you want to say, like, if the deal was good and they got a deal from someone else, I would look at the deal from say, well, that's a good deal. You should take that. I don't yeah. need every every part of everyone's transaction, but I want to develop the trust that they're going to at least ask for my advice. And so, you know, to do that and you start with either Zoom or in person, because now we do in person as well, it's really just being a conduit for real estate investors to meet and never selling them anything. I never ask for business. I don't promote the business. Right. You know, if my lenders are who are my sponsors, my lender title and attorneys, they'll sponsor. Uh, they're just there to hang out. They're not hard pushing anything because they know how I am. And that's what makes it a comfortable environment for investors to come to get some food, hang out, talk. We don't even really do we don't do like speeches or anything. I just let people interact and we're probably going to like adjust it a little, but I bring on guests to the zoom. And I think that's big because over time, you know, it, it would get boring. They're just like, everyone's looking at me to to yeah. talk. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of, I've said everything. We've been on like 40 zooms. So you bring in, you know, friends from the industry to talk and then, and then you can follow up and, and talk about that and, and bring people business and connect people. Yeah. I was, I'm so glad you went there because I was just thinking if, if I'm newer agent and it's better to have experience, there's no question about it. Yeah, but if I'm a yeah. newer agent, it is possible to create an investor zoom or meetup and just bring in experts to help, help manage it, run it, give the advice, give the presentation, Absolutely. manage the conversation. You don't have to provide all of the content. I think that a real estate meetup isn't a presentation. I think it's just, you know, like I said, you're just a conduit to create connections. So, you know, at my meetups, what I'm always looking to do is, oh, you know, 
Ted, you know, meet Bob, like you guys yeah. are looking for the same thing. And Pace Morby said something great. I was just at Bigger Pockets conference. I was on a pattern, a, a, a panel there. And uh, Pace said, like, when he's at his meetups, he says, what do you need? What do you got? And then, oh, you need this? Hey, Fred, come over here. He needs this. Connect. You're a connector. So even if you're not experienced real estate investor, if you're good with people, you're super ripe to start the meetup. And if you're an agent, don't be pushing your business. Don't put cards out on the table. They'll all know that you're an agent. They're still not going to work with you unless you can do what they need, but they will appreciate the meetup. And generally, uh, newer investors come to the meetup. What's great about new investors? You can help train them to do things the right way. And then over time, they'll do more transactions. But real estate agents always fail. And uh, many business people fail from being like short term focused. Right. If you think, well, this person, maybe over the next five years, they may do 10 deals, but they get all hopped up because they're not buying right away. And like, that's not how it works. You really want to be that connector and educator. So you can just be the person who brings the people together and you'll definitely get benefits. And the less you ask for, the more you will get. Yeah. And if you're, when you're just starting, I would assume you get a chance to introduce who you are to the whole room, right? So you lead yeah. the conversation or you lead the the opening at least and everyone introduce yourself and you don't necessarily have to worry so much about other agents in the room. They're going to be there, but if you're the one that's going to have the credibility of starting the, the group, I would assume. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this, Jonathan, because yeah. you're doing live in-person meetups. We do some of that too. And I could tell you, we were getting 80 to a hundred people a month. Yeah. And now we're lucky to get 12. Have this is all post COVID. So yeah. have you seen, have you seen similar results or are you getting people to show up outside the house now? Our, ours has always been like steady, even with the zooms, it's always like 20 to 40. And I think part of it is uh, I don't oversell it. I don't, you know, I post it on bigger pockets, but I don't really try. Like I'm comfortable with who comes every month and where they're going to find it. And I've never tried to overmarket it. Cause I can't, if there's 80 people there, I can't get to them all anyway. And if right. I'm the one bringing it and if they come for me, then I can't talk to everybody and I'm an introvert. So I really don't want to, it's like too yeah, much too. for me. So, um, you know, again, I mean, you have to look at it like this, the meetups, there's nothing to sell. So, less people is better interaction. I think of it like speed dating for investors. Like who can I connect to each other? Who can have good conversations? So yeah, but I think it, it gets light sometimes. And then uh, a lot of it's just based because I'm not trying that hard to promote it. Yeah, <laughs> You know, I just figure like people know it's like the first Wednesday of every month. So it's just a different location. They just have to look up on my website. Uh, cool. Love it. We're going to keep pushing our, our offline stuff. I, I think there's just something special and different about meeting in person shaking sure. a hand getting to know them we do we do drinks at ours like they're little mixers so i think yeah. just having a cheers with somebody i think that it's i think that's huge and so uh, i'm going to encourage the listeners whether it's jonathan's or someone else's if there's a live in-person meetup that's really what's going to separate your your relationship um to anything that's online so i encourage you to get out of the house go out and try to make it happen um, whether you're hosting or attending. So i just throw yeah. that in there. Now, Jonathan, yeah, we're agree. in Colorado. We do a lot of business here. Obviously, we do a lot of business in Minnesota, a couple of other markets across the country, but it's not the markets you're in. So if if my listeners say Colorado, heavy focus Colorado, Minnesota, what can they what can you do to help them? Or is there anything you could do to help them or or should they get to know you? Yeah. I mean, I think like just like I'm kind of unique on social media because I don't care even the slightest bit what I post. I post whatever I want with absolutely no regard to what it's going to do. There's no calls to action. I literally do not care. I just want to put out content about real estate, real estate investing, and it makes no difference to me what happens. So there, I have a, a, a crap ton of content on my YouTube channel for real estate investors in a playlist, which is just like talking about a lot of different things for investing. Some stuff is focused on New Jersey, but that's in a New Jersey playlist. But you know, I've invested in several states over my life. Uh, and I still uh, still right now looking out of state all over. To me, like investing is an educational business. You know, what are you looking to get educated about? How much do you want to grow? Where can you find not just a meetup, like you said, which I think is a phenomenal idea? Where can you find a mastermind? And then eventually, 
where can you pay for something that you're going to get, you know, a benefit out of? I don't advocate for brand new investors to pay for really anything because there's so much available podcasts like this, bigger pockets, there's plenty of meetups are free, do all that stuff so that when you do go to pay for it, you make sure that you're going to, you know, get a, an ROI on that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think my social is a great way to just look at real estate as a whole. I kind of like, I guess I coined myself like a real estate thought leader because I do like to, you know, like a little bit mock the industry from time to time. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, if you want to get good at real estate, you have to be good at business and also uh, have uh, the ability to find the humor and like, you know, uh, why am I watching the national news? Like, look, you're in Colorado and you invest in Colorado and Minnesota. I'm in New Jersey. I invest in New York. You know, I've invested in Florida, California. I'm watching the national news like someone in Topeka, Kansas. It doesn't even apply. You know, so all the doom and gloom about recession and like houses are impossible to sell. It literally makes no difference to, om to almost anybody because that's a conglomeration of everything pushed together. But real estate to its absolute core is local. It's a local business. And if you know your locality, you don't even need to watch the real estate news. And I don't, I never watch it. I think it's actually entertaining to look at that and then be like, well, I just, I just bought something. I'm like, you know, like it's possible. Anything's possible in real estate investing. And I think the funniest thing over the last, like, uh, I don't know, six months is everybody crying. Like there's no inventory. There's no inventory. And we live in like one of the densest countries in the world. There's literally inventory on every block everywhere. It's just not for sale on the open market. But all of us who've been investing off market and writing our own postcards and doing mailers for years know you just have to figure out how to get to them. But like, you're not, don't tell me there's not inventory. I live on a block with like 50 other houses. Like there's inventory ever, literally everywhere around me. I love it. Here's what I got out of this. And I want you to tell me if there's any pieces of advice. So I'm actually going to ask you a, a more direct question after this. But sure. so, Jonathan, we um, we talked a lot today. You said you're um, talking about people as a business. What I really got out of this is it's a people business. So you think about your tenants, you think about your contractors, you think about your, your Airbnb manager. The different things we talked about was this is definitely a people business. Um, the thing you learned uh, during 2008, I have a lot more tougher lessons than you, man, but you, you learned <laughs> a big one to take advice from your advisor. So you hire them for a reason. Um, many people fo uh, are so short-term focused. You say focus on the long-term, totally agree with that. And there is inventory everywhere. So stop complaining. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question about yeah. that because I hear a similar, I mean, demand's down too, right? The only yeah. thing yeah. down more than demand is inventory. Yeah, which is why prices are going up nationally. And I know it's block by block, as you suggested, but um, look, demand's down too. So we could we could be cheering on that. So there's there's no no real reason to complain here. But we're in a very interesting market. There's volatility like you would not believe. I haven't seen. I've been doing this for twenty years. I haven't seen volatility like this. Yeah. Yeah, Interest yeah. rates and inflation, and then stocks, and now you have crypto, which we never had to worry about, and all these <laughs> things influence it, right? Um, and with interest rates at a, I don't know, what is it now, a 20-something year high, is this a time to be buying? Like, what advice can you give us about what, what we're experiencing right now? Yeah, I love the question. And it's funny because, like, Barbara Corcoran was on and she said, like, now's a great time to buy. And then everybody panned her for saying that. So this is what I, the advice that I give to people. If you're comfortable with the rates and you understand your finances, every time is a great time to buy. If you understand what you're buying and why you're buying it. So even though like, look, inventory technically on market inventory is low, demand is low. But one thing I've been saying for, you know, a few months now is when I see everybody swimming one direction, I'm immediately looking the other direction where nobody is. So if demand is low, that means for me, demand is high because everybody else is sitting on the sidelines scared. I'm not scared because I've been stockpiling money during the pandemic just to wait for it. But I also have the patience to keep waiting because there's a seller and buyer thing, especially in large scale multifamily where they're not connecting on price. It's still happening in your regular yeah. traditional single family rental market where they still think that they're in control. And, and most markets are still seller's markets, but I'm telling you right now, buyers have much more control than they think. This is a great time to just get back in. Look, you can go look at as many houses as you want. No one's going to force you to buy them. 
You know, if the deal's not right, you just don't write an offer. It's pretty simple. So why go sit on the sidelines when you can still be in the game and look off market, no wholesalers. If you're a traditional investor and you have, you know, cash or access to cash, understand what's out there. And uh, so I, uh, my whole life, I've never gone through a cycle where I thought it was a bad time to buy. And I, I'm, I'm looking harder right now than I've looked in probably five years. I'm exploring uh, syndications, short-term rentals, storage, uh, you know, short-term uh, other stuff that is, is interesting to me is just, I'm looking at everything, you know, main street redevelopment. That's what I'm really interested in. You know, I'm looking at a building that's like around the corner from here in my town. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of like back as like a kid now, you know, and, and part of that is like, you know, from having, you know, this podcast, it's like, on my podcast is the same as you, like you said in the beginning, it's like, I mean, how much better is this? I just talk to investors every time I get off, I learn something and then I, I go apply it. So now I'm like kind of jacked up about looking at all of these different investment portals because I've been saving, you know, just waiting with money because I'm patient. So uh, yeah, I never think it's a bad time to buy because if you're active, you never know. And, and again, to the first point that you were relaying about what you got from this, the relationships are what find you a lot of deals. And that doesn't matter to a market. The market makes no difference if, you know, Bob Smith needs to offload a property because he wants to get another one. And he wants to do a 1031 and needs to dump this property. Or, you know, if you're looking at absentee owners, it's always a good time to buy from absentee owners. If you find someone who lives in California and they own two properties in New Jersey, why do they want two properties in New Jersey? Terrible investment. So like, it's just about how much digging you're willing to do. And again, in that short-term, long-term thing is most people don't really want to do much work. They want it to just work for them. You know, that's why like take a wholesaling course and then think it's going to just make the money. Like you have to do all the steps. The course is good. You're just not doing the work. It's user error. I couldn't agree with what you just said more, honestly. I mean, I agree with everything you said. I I love and it, it, It's a tougher market now to be an investor. Yeah, for I'm not sure, gonna, for sure. I'm not going to question or challenge that. But if you're getting into it now, my gosh, what better time to get started? Because now you're entering into a challenging market. Yeah. So if you could have, even if it's a little bit of success right now, can you imagine what your success is going to be when the market does shift? Now exactly. you did say something I wanted to ask about. You said, if it's not a right, if it's not a good deal, it doesn't look like a good deal based on, it sounds like maybe a list price or something, don't offer on it. I would just ask you, is it ever bad to offer on something? What if I offer something like, 800,000 on a property that's listed for over 2 million, right? Yeah. You never know one. And two, if you're a serious buyer, they may come back and you should be having a follow-up system, right? Some kind of yeah. tickler. Um, so, so that's I'm a thinking, great question. Offer, offer, offer. Yeah. It, it would be my, my thought. Well, so let me tell you more about my background. So I, I was a trial attorney for uh, seven years. I was a prosecutor for seven years. So I, I did 250 jury trials, negotiated, I don't know, wow. 10,000 cases on a daily basis. And then I was a criminal defense attorney. So I was involved in negotiations daily with the highest stakes for 10 years. And the thing I learned about negotiation is that everything's about leverage. And I don't mean leverage as in mortgage. I mean, right. leverage as how do you understand how you're going to be on top in the deal? So there are great times when you should make a low ball offer. The best way to make a low ball offer is when you can actually support it and, and in the data. Even if they say no to you, if they read everything and how you got to your price of 800, it makes sense to them and they'll come back to you later. But there's a very, very important psychological science. Like if you watch someone like Chris Voss, like this is all about negotiation. And the whole point is you have to know exactly when the other side is ready. So if I'm looking at a property, say it's listed for a million dollars, I know it's worth 750. I'm not doing anything when it's at a million. I'm going to talk to the agent or the wholesaler. I'm going to see like, hey, you know, what's going on? Are they open to something? I'm not, you can't make a low ball offer when it's been on the market for 10 days. Like you have to just watch the thing marinate. The second that they make a price reduction, people think that's a time to go in. It's like, no, you're still, you go in to see it again. And then you give them the feedback again that says, listen, I'm still at my number. I don't know where you're coming up with this number. And the best way to get them to prove it is to tell you the agent or the wholesaler, hey, how'd you come up with this price? Can you send me the comps that you use to come up with this price that look like this property? Because they're not going to be able to send them. 
And then you start to use that in a dialogue. So the reason why I don't uh, advocate for like just making a bunch of low offers is because I only want to make one offer on a property. And that's something that I learned, you know, as a prosecutor, the defense attorneys would come in and they would say, you know, whatever my client wants, you know, uh, 365 days. And I would say, well, I'm offering a, a year and a day. You, ha you have five minutes to decide and I'm going to time it. And I put my watch on and time it. And all my friends who has prosecutors with know this is like true. And if they came back at five minutes and one second, that offer was gone. And that's how I am in real estate too. And the other side doesn't like it, but I say like, listen, I'm offering you 700 today. If you don't take it today, uh, the next time that you come back to me, you know, because I feel like I'm the best buyer, this is not in a multiple offer situation. This is when it's me versus them and the property has problems that I know I can solve. I say, when you come back, it's going to be 685. You know, and then if you don't do that, you're ruining your whole stance. So uh, that's the way that I negotiate. I learned it from my background as a lawyer um, and as an investor. You know, I can't do that for clients because my clients have to be in charge of their negotiation. But as an investor, like I'm pretty tough. I'll tell them you're about to go through an inspection with a first time home buyer. They're going to find the structural problem. Then it's going to fall out. Then you're going to be back on market. Then everybody's going to think something's wrong because something is wrong. I'm telling you something's wrong now. I can see the structural problem. You know, it's going to cost like 20 to 30 grand. So I'm offering you a better deal. And you know, I'm a closer. It's hard because that agent's negotiating, you know, with the seller, the seller thinks the property's fine. I'm usually right in those scenarios. And then it plays back in my favor. But again, the, the same offer is not available because now I had to wait all that time when I didn't want to wait. So, the, you know, that's just part of an investor mindset. And I think to your point, though, if you are making lower offers, as long as you can, uh, you know, attribute it to something, whether it be the comps in the area, the data, and you can show all the data, and then you just let it go, they will come back to you because you're yeah. correct on the price so that when they they finally realize that you're the first person they're going to come to because everybody else just sent them a piece of paper with nothing around it, which is a slap in the face to a seller, even if they're wrong. Yeah, great. Very different than what I was expecting you to say, but I love it. Yeah, I appreciate um, it. Cool. Well, I'm excited to be on your podcast. Yeah, me too. Um, it's coming why don't up. you tell us tell us about your podcast and then how we get a hold of you and then we'll close it or wrap yeah. this up. Yeah. So as I started Zen in the Art of Real Estate Investing as the mindful approach to real estate investing. A kind of my own personal journey has been a, a journey into mindfulness after I turned 40. I'm 52 now. Uh, it's changed my whole life, the way that I think about things, the way that I think about myself, my self-awareness. So I wanted to make sure that there was an investing podcast out there that was more focused on like process and digging in. You know, you've asked me great questions. That's what I do on my podcast. I want to find things that I think other people might not ask about and ask the guests about that. So that, you know, listeners, as you know, like your listeners of this, it's like, they're not going to hear what I said someone else because I'm an oddity, you know, and every guest has their own thing. And, you, you know, you try to play up what the guest has to bring so that when you're driving in your car, you know, or you're at the gym, you're just getting something that you've never heard before, you know, and that that's what I think is so interesting. So, yeah, we're almost at episode 100. You'll probably I think by the time yours one comes out, you'll be over 100. But it's been a it's been a, you know, I love it. What's but I mean, I love this. I love being on your show yeah. because I just like talking about real estate investing. And one thing I'll say before we hop off and I give, you know, where the people could find me is that if you want to know if somebody's real, like there's a lot of shiny objects out there on social media, like everybody looks like they're the best investor ever. Find an episode that they've been on a podcast. If you listen to somebody, like if you're listening to us talk for 45 or 60 minutes, you know who knows what they're talking about. There's no way to get around it on a podcast because none right. of us are doing major edits. It's just... You either know that someone can continually answer the questions and is like really passionate about real estate investing. And if you don't get that, that's not the person for you. <laughs> it's just not. That's more great advice. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, we think about like, oh, my due diligence on somebody and I always do this. So I Google their name, right? We all start yeah. with that. And then uh, Google their name plus reviews or their name plus complaints or their name plus whatever. I never thought about, why don't you just listen to a podcast they were on or check out a video or a YouTube it's or the, something. I'm telling you, it's the easiest way. Like I'm a, I've obviously like I'm a guest on a lot of shows as well and you'll be on mine, but like I love to listen to like other people that I know as a guest because I'm like, wow, that's really where there's nowhere to hide. Yeah, you know? totally. And I think if you look at the social media also, you can tell is someone just marketing something 
or are they giving you real advice? I, I'm not, I'm less concerned because a lot of people use the same, you know, they use captions or they use rev or something. So things look the same, but like, is the information seem like not can. And if you go on my social media, I don't give a crap. <laughs> I say whatever I want about whatever I want. And I think that it's funny and I don't care what anybody thinks. It makes no difference to me how many followers I have or what it's trending or what I did last month. I don't care. My social media, honestly, 100% is just for myself. You know, I think well, that I, I, like, I, I like it. You know what I mean? It's like, why would I do social media if it's not fun? You know, that's why I don't use Facebook. It's not fun at all. It's I hate it. So I like Instagram, like Instagram's my favorite. And I like TikTok. People give like a bad name to TikTok, but like TikTok's pretty entertaining for me. Like I, I actually find a lot of good stuff on there and it's also a pretty solid search engine. So we we're just getting started with uh, TikTok. So I'm glad you said that. Yeah. No, it, it, you'd be surprised. Uh, uh, people search more for things to do on TikTok than people think. Like YouTube is number one because YouTube it, you know, is a search engine. It's not yeah. a social media site and everything on YouTube's evergreen. TikTok's a little bit more like that than people think. There's a lot of junk on there, but there's a lot more funny stuff. So like for me, like I, I don't, I, I, I look at social media a lot, but it's not, a, I'm not losing a ton of time on it because it, it helps me. I'm looking at what other people do in investing. And I'm like, I hate that. I never want to do that. And then I see somebody else with like a really good information. I'm like, that's cool. Everything is, 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 is copyable in your own way. You know, and that's what people sit scrolling about nothing, you know, and I like to look at puppies too. I like that. I think it's fun. I like to look at the dodo, but I'm also trying to learn so I can add to my business on social media. So my scroll time isn't just like the void. Oh man, we could go on a whole thing. I'm, I'm reading yeah. a book right now about this and, you know, there's studies now coming out that social media can actually be beneficial depending on what you're using it for. Like yeah. if you're using it to just scroll people and then you're jealous of them, then you're going to be depressed. Right. But if you're like for you, you're using it to add value to your to your knowledge and to your business. Yeah. There's studies that say if you're interacting with people, it's creating camaraderie and it's it's uh, it actually is the opposite of depression. So some people are benefiting um their happiness from social yeah. media. So we DMs can go on a long great. conversation yeah. about this, right? But yeah. we do got to wrap it up. So maybe yeah. I'll have to have you back on at some point because yeah, I'd love to. It's just not we don't get a three decade investor very often. So this has been this has been <laughs> fantastic, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate yeah. it, Kevin. Thanks so much for for having me on. You know, people can find me, like you said before. Yeah. Uh, trust Green is my social. It's it's trust with green with an E at the end. Uh, same on TikTok and Instagram. My YouTube channel is Jonathan Green R E. Um, and then my hub site is trustgreen.com where it has like this episode will be up on there. I put all the episodes and the YouTube links and all the links to the podcasts up there, uh, guest appearances. And then you can find my podcast on there as well. All right. We'll make sure that's all in the video and in the show notes. <laughs> and I really, really appreciate you coming and spending a little bit over an hour with me today, Jonathan. I had such a great time. I learned a lot from you. Um, I definitely think we're going to stay in touch because I want to have you back <laughs> on and I want to learn sure. more from you if you're open to it. So Thank you again for your time. And until next time, we'll, we'll catch you later. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Hey, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you did, please be sure to follow and leave us a review. Oh, yeah. And tell a friend.